for um, webinars to come. I'm part of the Covision team as well. So, um, so I've got the, the privilege of being the first to speak on this webinar series. I was given the title scoping review or systematic review simply because at the start we weren't sure which I should talk about and it somehow remained and I actually realised this sometimes is exactly the problem when you are creating a review that you have, you don't know whether to go for a scoping review or systematic review. So I shall talk through a little bit about both things that are the same, um, things that are different, but ultimately we're talking about evidence synthesis. So I'm going to talk you through the process today. Um, some of you will know all of this before, some of you this might be new, So, um, but hopefully you'll get something from it somewhere along the way. So let's see. As I say, it's really about um, strategies and methods to determine knowledge and gaps. That's what our review process is about. We want to find out how things have happened, where, what and when, what's already happened, maybe what literature is out, out there and to combine it. Research papers, you can find individual ones, you can read individual ones and you can determine maybe they're good, maybe they're not good. What do you include? What do you not include? Um, so you have to go through a process. I'm going to go back a step because what is a research paper structure? And typically you have an abstract, introduction, methods, results, discussion. That's the, um, the main part of the paper. The abstract is a really a summary of the paper and it's a very condensed summary of 250, 500 words. And it summarizes what's actually in the dash box. The dash box is the main crux of the paper, the how, why, how, what, and also the so what. Um, do, we need, do we need to know this? Um, was it worthwhile? And I apologize since I know that it is actually lunchtime, but my analogy to this is very much baking a cake. So the why of a paper is why are we baking a cake? What's the reason for doing it? Is there a birthday party? Did we want a treat? Is there another reason? So often um, you're producing in a paper the, the stages of why you need to do this piece of work. What's the reason behind it? The methods then is how you're going to go about it. So in terms of a cake, that will be the ingredients you're going to use and the steps, the process that you're going to go about it, that you're going to cream the butter and sugar, then you're going to add the eggs, then you're going to add the flour, then you're going to put it in the oven. So it's those sort of steps. Um, the results then is the outcome, what you produce, the result, that is the cake. And then lastly, the discussion is the so what. So that's when you're really talking about, well, how did it taste? Would you do it again? Was it worthwhile? Um, did it actually work okay for you? So that's the general stages that you have of a research paper. As I mentioned before, we're dealing really with evidence synthesis. So that's about finding out what is known, but also crucially, what is not known such that um, you could actually then go, well, this is why this piece of research is needed. And literature reviews can sit very much as a part of a larger study that you're collecting data within, or it can be a piece of research in its own right. Um, and that's where systematic and scoping reviews often come in as a piece of work in their own right. And in terms of evidence synthesis, systematic reviews are at the top, are at the actual uh, pinnacle of what, um, so I'm just reading. Um, so they're the pinnacle of the evidence, quality of evidence that are out there. It brings about multiple slide, um, studies answering the same research question. So, Without further ado, and if all goes well, I'm going to share with you now a little video um, and hopefully this will work. In everyday settings, the term research can be used quite loosely. 
You might hear someone say that she researched a medical diagnosis through a Google search. Or your friend may have researched allergy medicines by asking for recommendations on Facebook. The results of this kind of research can be biased. But even literature or narrative reviews, which generally summarize articles written on a particular topic, can also be biased. A literature review may only include articles that were readily available to the author, came from the most prominent scholars in the field, or were selected based on other subjective means. The systematic review can attempt to serve as a solution to this bias. A systematic review is a type of literature review that involves posing a question and designing a detailed strategy for searching, identifying, reviewing, and synthesizing all of the relevant literature on a particular topic. Systematic reviews are exhaustive, and they are designed with a protocol that will allow for others to replicate the review if needed. Systematic reviews will always contain a section in which the author or authors explain the criteria used to select articles. The research in a systematic review can also be strengthened by the inclusion of a meta-analysis. Often, a systematic review includes a meta-analysis which uses statistical analysis to synthesize data from a number of studies. The nature of the data may call for varying approaches from calculating means and standard deviations to computing a correlation ratio. The results of a meta-analysis may highlight a pattern in the literature or determine some type of consistent finding across a large number of studies. The bias of an author can still work its way into a meta-analysis or systematic review through a variety of means, including the poor design of the review. Despite these challenges, systematic reviews continue to be beneficial for their ability to provide synthesized information, especially in a time when the publication of scholarly articles has significantly increased. In everyday settings, the term research can be used quite loosely. So as this pointed out there, it is about bringing research together, but we're always trying to reduce bias, our own personal bias. So we have to go through a rigorous process and the systematic review is the, the most rigorous of them all. There are many different types of literature reviews. Um, sort of you have narrative and literature reviews would be less well-defined, but very um, um, well-defined ones would include systematic reviews, rapid reviews, scoping reviews, um, integrative reviews, and even reviews of reviews. Um, so there's a variety of different types. Some require more resource than others. Some are more formalized than others. Um, and so it depends what you're after, which type of review you ultimately go for. Today, of course, it's about systematic reviews and scoping reviews. And I'm not going to reinvent the wheel, but I'm going to point, you out, point out to you some very useful resources that are out there, including the Joanna Briggs Institute, really recommend. Um, just put that, those details in and you will have reams of resources. Um, so the JBI has a manual for evidence synthesis and they have it both online. And if you prefer, you can also have a PDF version of it as well. And the latest edition came out April this year. So they have many different chapters on different types of systematic reviews. So systematic reviews of qualitative evidence, systematic reviews of text and opinion, mixed method systematic reviews, so, but they also have scoping reviews there. So um, there's a variety of different ways and great resource to have and to lead. If you're new to these processes, it will very gently lead you through the process. And one, and this is a table from um, the JBI manual, and you will see the differences and similarities in, of different types of reviews. So you will see, for instance, that um, the last two columns being the scoping review and systematic review, that a protocol is often, will always be required for a systematic review and for some scoping reviews. This means that you've thought through the process beforehand and written up what you're going to do. In terms of a systematic review, you would reg register it in Pressboro um, and keep it updated as to where you are in the process. 
But common to both scoping and systematic reviews is that you have explicit, transparent, peer-reviewed search strategy. So it's very exhaustive. It's very, um, it, it's any, by you giving the details, anybody else could follow it and would come to the same conclusions as yourself. And it, there's a standardized data extraction form for both processes. So there's a very, there is quite a formalized way of doing it. Of note here is the critical appraisal. Um, so systematic reviews, yes, it's needed. Scoping reviews, it's not mandatory, but as noted below the table, critical appraisal is not mandatory. However, reviewers may decide to assess and report the risk of bias in scoping re reviews depending on the purpose of the review. So for some people um, and for some studies, you may want to include a critical appraisal as well, even in a scoping review. So to look then at the actual um, search strategy and data extraction, that's what I'm going to talk through with you now. So again, from the JBI manual, the framework of a scoping review was originally um, proposed in 2005. It was enhanced in 2010 and again further by Peters in 2015. And really, as it, you can see here, the, the most current um, version is really to find this, to go through the search strategy, you have to define and align the objectives and questions, develop and align the inclusion criteria, describe and plan an approach to search, select, extract and present the evidence. And then you actually go and do the searching for the evidence, the selecting of the evidence and the extraction. So you have everything thought through before you begin. So let's actually go through this process. So to specify objectives and hypothesis, your aims and objectives, your research question of your scoping review. So if you're dealing with a systematic review, what is very useful is what's known as PICO. P standing for the population, I for the intervention, C for the comparator, and O for the outcome. So if you had say you were interested in anti-hypertension drugs and stroke, this PICO will allow you to maybe formulate your research question. So for instance, your interest is anti-hypertensive drugs reduce the risk of stroke in patients with mild hypertension when compared with placebo. So the patient group has, or the population are patients with mild hypertension. The intervention is your anti-hypertensive drugs comparator is placebo and the outcome is whether risk or your whether you have a stroke or not so your risk of stroke. Noting that for a systematic review the research question aims to answer a very specific and very um, question which is based on very precise inclusion criteria so it's a very detailed but narrow um, review. So it comprehensively obtains all information, but only about this one research question. In comparison, when you're looking at a scoping review, um, the PCC concept or population concept context is a great way to formulate your or to think through your research question. So for instance, um, if you're looking at quality of life and tonsil like tonomies, um, you could come up with a question such as what quality of life questionnaires are available for pediatric patients following tonsillectomies with or without, and this is where I, adonatectomies for chronic infections or sleep disordered breathing. So the population here is pediatric patients following um, the removal of their tonsils. The concept in this case um, is in this sense will be with or without um, intervention or for sleep disorders, breathing, etc. Um, and where interest is in the quality of life questionnaires. But we've left it very broad in the sense we haven't decided, we haven't defined where the quality of life questionnaires have to happen. Can it happen at home? Can it happen online? Does it have to be in person? So we've left that quite broad. And that is where the scope review is slightly different. It reviews is broader. You're getting a scope, a feel for the area 
and the criteria for inclusion is much less restrictive, um, such that you're getting that broader sense of what's happening. Now, as I say, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I will direct you very much to this brilliant article by Mon Natal and um, they debate and go through, should it be a scoping review or a systematic review and giving you guidance on how to determine which approach. Um, that came out in 2018 and I say, very good article to use. But as you can see, the results are that researchers may conduct systematic reviews instead sorry, scoping reviews instead of systematic reviews, where the purpose of the review is to identify knowledge gaps, to scope a body of literature, clarify concepts, or to investigate research conduct. While useful in their own right, scoping reviews may also be helpful as a precursor to systematic reviews and can be used to confirm the relevance of inclusion criteria and potential questions. So although conducted for different purposes compared to systematic reviews, scoping reviews still require rigorous and transparent methods in their conduct to ensure the results are trustworthy. So you'll find that actually for scoping reviews and systematic reviews, a lot of the stages are the same. And that's what I'm continually showing you here today. So to locate relevant articles, this process is the same regardless if you're in a scoping review or a systematic review. You have to establish your criteria, what you're going to include, what you're going to exclude, and you have to also conduct some searches using databases, maybe keywords that you're interested in. So how would you go about this? Oh, and then, sorry, you have to screen what you get back. Um, this is known as the screening process. And typically you start with abstract and titles, first of all, um, then followed by full text screening, noting any reasons why you may exclude papers at that stage, and then you end up with this pile of included studies. And this screening process should involve at least two people. The reason being is that, again, it's just transparency to reduce the bias of any one person's view to keep it more rigorous. So you may have person A and person B, and if they both say yes, then the paper goes through to the next stage. One says maybe, one says yes, it still goes through. But if they both say no, it's not relevant, then it goes into an exclude pile, it, go, it gets, um, it's deemed irrelevant. But if there's indecision, if one person says yes, the other no, or maybe a maybe and a no, then you can bring in a third person to reach the decision to see what they think, or A and B can come together and reach a consensus together, um, such that you are making sure that you're transparent about your decision making as well. So going on, you still have a lot of databases then to go and conduct your search in. Now, these are just some, there are many out there, and this is where your own decision has to be a scoping review, you maybe are, because you're wanting to just get a feel for the literature, you may only include a few. If it's a systematic review, you tend to be more thorough, more rigorous, um, but there will be certain databases more relevant than others. So for instance, ERIC covers education, whereas Scopus is more social science based, PubMed is biomedical. So depending on the area you're covering, different databases will be more or less relevant. So that's the main peer reviewed literature, but you also can have what's known as great literature databases, um, which you may want to search, which are more your reports or um, other form, sometimes where you can get really good key information. But um, again, it depends what your interest is in. You can also bring in by looking at the included studies reference lists and see what they're referencing and whether there's something you should bring into your own review process and also through forward citation who has you have this wonderful article who has actually referenced it into the future and should you include that work as well and that's what's known as sort of other sources or grey literature into a study. How do you find the things? Well, you need keywords that sort of come through your PICO or your PCC, but then you need to also think of all the variations, all the different mesh terms that could exist for it. 
thus most definitely speak to your librarian the subject expert they deal with us all the time and so they really will help and guide you in this process um, and so it's very key so it is really crucial so you may think um stroke but does it have a more medical name is there variations on that is it the same in an american as a language spelling as an english language you know so you have to think across and um, to get as comprehensive a search as possible and then as i say you have your inclusion exclusion criteria so for the example i had given maybe only randomized control trials very specific you need at least a year follow-up we're only wanting mild or moderate hypertension and we're com comparing treatment to placebo so you can predefine this. Um, I think it goes without saying, but you can also say human participants. Um, you can also say it must be peer reviewed journals, that the trial must be completed. Um, things like that can all come into it. And here's just an example of how you might build up uh, a search strategy. So this is an example from a, pro a published protocol for a scoping review um, by the wonderful Katie Kerr. Um, this was her PhD work. And um, you can see this is searching within with Ovid in Medline. And first off, she went through two different search strategies of looking at the condition, which was rare disease, and various terms for that. And it was to do with multi-omic analysis, so various possibilities for that. So she did search strategy three, then four, then five. But she then combined one and two together. So that was all to do with the condition. Then she combined three, four, five, and six together, the green box all together as one. And then she essentially combined the results from the blue box and the green box for her last um, the overall outcomes from this database. And you unfortunately do this for each database that you've decided to include. And that produces then the actual paper here, you produce a Prisma diagram where you define how many um, articles were found through searches, in this case 1,770. 19 were identified from other sources, so that can be a reference list or um, some other way or through colleagues knowing of important records. You then need to remove duplicates, which software and note covidence are all very good at doing. And then you start the screening process. So that's where you have this um, 1,004, this was quite large, 1,417 to screen, then to fill articles. And then actually what made the list in the end, 66 articles that we did an art of synthesis on. So it's, you always have a Prisma flow diagram to show you and be transparent to how you reach the studies that you're going to include in your review. So if we located them, we now have our relevant studies. Now we need to actually extract the information from them. So it may be simply, uh, a table like this and um, pre-agreed that everybody um, extracts. So uh, one person maybe extracts this data and then another um, verifies it. The author and year of the publication, the country it was in, the setting, what was the sample size, what method was used and key findings. So you're summarizing the paper within these tables um, and just bringing out the core work from each paper. If it's a systematic review where you're dealing with an intervention, you typically have a quantitative outcome, in which case you then also need to extract those um, aspects as well. So for our example of the antihypertensive drugs and stroke, these would be the outcomes that we would have been of interest. And there's a number of papers have returned. And in terms of the risk of stroke, um, for the Sweden 1975 paper, the odds ratio was 0.54, but the confidence interval was from 0.2 to 1.48. So that actually doesn't give us a conclusive answer whether or not antihypertensive drugs work or not. Whereas the USA study, 
because both limits are below um, one, actually says the risk of end stroke is reduced. So that proved that it was. So what do we do? Um, how do we bring this all together? That's what you do next. Um, you can combine the estimates and that's what's known in systematic reviews as your meta-analysis or your, um, you're producing your forest plots. So now there's a few stages in between there, which I'll not go into today about investigating the heterogeneity of the studies and also publication bias, but I just want to talk you through a forest plot. So this is actually the same information as was on our table. Um, what we have is the studies down the side and you actually have your odds ratio along the x-axis. The value of one means that there's no difference. The risk of stroke with the drugs or without the drugs is the same. If it's lower than one, then the treatment group, um, there's lower odds of stroke in the treatment group. If it's higher than one, then there's higher odds of a stroke in the treatment group. We say the line one means no difference. Each little square is the odds ratio from each individual study. And then the line represents the confidence interval. So anywhere along this line, the true value of the, of the odds ratio may lie. And as you can see, some are very short, some are very long. Um, um, how do we bring this together? That's where we find our pooled result. And that's where your meta-analysis comes in. And it brings together all the information and creates a pooled estimate represented by a diamond at the bottom of your forest plot. And the corners of your diamond are the confidence interval of your pooled estimate. And as you can see, it most definitely is below one. In this case, the treatment does reduce the risk of stroke. Here's another example and just a slightly different way of presenting it. This is an antibiotics in, cold, in the common cold, where indeed there was a number of studies. You actually have in forest plot over here on the right hand side, all the data is there. But the main thing in the blue box, you have your pooled result and you can see the big diamond shaped is, has the value of one going through it. Antibiotics do not um, reduce the having the occurrence of common cold or does not actually, it's not effective against the common cold. Okay, so I've gone very quickly through today um, evidence synthesis of both um, scoping reviews and systematic reviews. The main thing about systematic reviews is that you're bringing together um, studies that re, um, address the exact same research question. Um, and the meta-analysis is a way of producing the findings in a nice summary document for you, or plot for you. The advantages of this is that of a systematic review, you're increasing the power so you're also reduced, the results are more generalizable and say you are producing a summary of the findings. Increases the power because you have studies, um, you're increasing the number of people that have been investigated. One study may have 100, another may have 500, another may have 600. So ultimately, you now have a study with the size of 1,200 people. It's more generalizable because you're you're bringing together studies from America, from Europe, from Asia, so that it's more generalizable to all populations and all people. So this is where I'm going to show you now a second video, which kind of summarizes what I have done, what I've been talking about so far. Um, and I'll just open it up for us. What are systematic reviews? Systematic reviews help make sense of many kinds of data. They're a way of reviewing all the data and results from research about a particular question in a standardized, systematic way. A systematic review helps give an objective and transparent overview of all evidence surrounding a particular question. 
The Cochrane Collaboration logo visually represents how results from some systematic reviews can be explained. Here's how a systematic review works. First, a question must be defined, and an objective method for asking the question is agreed. Imagine a circle as the area defined by a question. Everything inside it concerns the question. Everything outside of it does not. In this circle, relevant data will be included. A search for relevant data begins. This data can come from many sources, including data from clinical trials. Imagine the shapes represent data sets from different research, for example, different clinical trials. The data set must be the right shape to fit. Only data from research that matches certain criteria can be included so that the results are reliable. For example, selecting research that is good quality and answers the defined question. If the research meets the criteria, more detailed information about the research can be collected or extracted. Information extracted can include how the research was done, often called the method, who participated in the research, including how many people, how it was paid for, for example, funding sources, what happened, the outcomes. This information is judged against criteria in order to assess the quality of the research. Once the information is extracted, it can be combined using complex statistical methods to give an overall result from all of the data. This circle is one way of representing this data visually. It's called a blobogram or a forest plot. The area of inquiry defined by the question can be divided into a yes and a no half, a positive and a negative side. The shorter the line, the more confident we are of what the data is telling us. Think of a longer line as less focused and scattered data, and shorter as more focused and bunched. Imagine knowledge as light and ignorance as darkness. The more spread the focus of the light, the weaker it is, and the less clear things are. If the light is focused and data is grouped more clearly, we can be more confident of what we see. The diamond represents the combined results of all the data included. Because this combined result uses data from more sources than just one data set, it's considered more reliable and better evidence. The more data there is, the more confident we can be. So this is where the Cochrane um, logo actually comes from, from the forest plot itself. Um, and just to point out that the Cochrane systematic reviews would be the most stringent of all systematic reviews. And if you're looking for evidence, that's where I would go. And actually, if you're in need or wish to um, have help with key terms and what to search for, often look at other articles or Cochrane reviews to see what they've searched and learn from what others have done. So there is a bit of an art form, of course, to all of this. Um, so in terms actually of a looking at a research question, this is one that um, Professor Mike Clark came up with and it's, I love it and I keep using it in teaching as well because you kind of go, does drinking coffee raise people's blood pressure? You kind of go, that makes sense. You drink too much coffee, you can get the jitters, you can, you can feel your heart pumping. But you then need to sort of go back to your pico and go, well, what people are we talking about? I haven't actually defined them here. Should I look at anybody? Should I maybe exclude infants and babies? I don't think we should be giving them coffee just yet. And equally, is it right to give a 90-year-old? Is that the same as a 19-year-old? So maybe we want to define the population that we're interested in. Our intervention here is coffee. But what is coffee? Well, is it a mug of coffee? Is it an espresso? Does it have to be instant, percolated, warm, iced? So we need to define better what we mean by coffee itself and maybe go, well, what exactly do we mean by that? And what are we comparing it to? We haven't actually mentioned that in our research question. 
do we assign some people to have coffee and then some to have tea? Mm, do we give some coffee and some water? Well then, is it coffee we're testing or the caffeine? So we need to be really sure what you're asking and that is going to give you the results that you are wanting it to give you. Thankfully, the outcome here, blood pressure is really well defined and can be measured, it's not subjective. And sometimes we add on T for time. How long do we conduct this for? Do we ask people to have five cups of coffee a day and to do this for the next two weeks? Maybe five cups of coffee is what they normally take. Maybe it's not. So we, you need to kind of think, well, how long are you going to measure this for? How long is the intervention for? And to have that defined into. So it takes a bit of art form to come up with your research question. But certainly the PICO and the, the PCC, I think, are great ways of actually helping you through that process. Also, what helps is um, that within the actual systematic review and scoping review, we should follow the PRISMA guidelines. PRISMA standing for Preferred Reporting Items for Systematic Reviews and Meta-Analyses. And I would say go to the website and they will guide you through and you'll get brownie points with your supervisors. They have come up or updated it this year and it was only published in March of this year for the new 2020 Prisma um, aspect. And what you come through is, and this will often go into supplementary material in your articles, you detail what you have, uh, your title, where these all appear, such that you have put into your paper everything you should have. And they've also um, given software that you can use online to help you produce your Prisma diagram and produces it automatically for you. So um, definitely recommend it. It's very, very useful. So that's for systematic reviews. There's equally the scoping review one as well. And it goes through 22 different items, sorry. So again, it's on the Prisma website, pardon me. And they also have a lovely little ex exclamation um, video to go with it as well and that was, came out in 2018 and it's known as the Prisma SCR so just for the scoping review it's extension. Again there's a number of items and it's details um, that you have in your paper and where you should place them and it also gives you a lovely um, what it means by each of these items as well. So that very much talks you through what should be in your paper when you write your research article up. Now, just to finish off, this quality appraisal is mentioned within systematic reviews, you should actually quality appraise or risk a bias tool for each paper that you include within your, within your review. For scoping reviews, this is optional, but as mentioned before, it depends upon what you're answering, whether you should include this or not. For this approach, Thankfully, there's a number of tools out there and there's just whatever you prefer to use. There's CASP, which is Critical Appraisal Skills Program. But as you see, they have a number of different um, checklists that can be used for different types of studies. Whether your paper you find your included studies qualitative, or whether it's a randomized controlled trial. And this is what it looks like. It's a lot of questions, but simply you have to answer yes, no, or can't tell. So you're appraising, did the included study actually document everything really well or not? And there's initial assessment. There's a section which will deal about the methods of your included study. The results section, and then the so what, the, the discussion section. And lots of questions to help you to, to sort of go, did they clearly explain this? Did they clearly bring in that? Um, and um, it just helps you through that. So it's most times it's what's not, it's not about what's written in a paper, but it's maybe what they've forgotten to tell you that this helps bring up. The JBI also have critical appraisal tools and a number of different ones. And here I'm just showing you the quality, qualitative research. And again, yeah, it's no one clear. And so you get an overall sense of how strong a foundation the included studies are, are built on 
are they uh, uh, of high quality, mm, quality or very weak? Um, and so that gives you a sense of how um, much confidence you have about their conclusions when you're bringing everything together. So as I say, it's really about critiquing the study design of your included studies. And you would do this for each of them. And you, what type of study design was used? Was it appropriate? Did it actually answer the research question? How did they allocate participants to various groups? Was it um, convenience? Did they randomize them? Um, if they did randomize, how did they go about that? And if you're of an intervention control group, where they have similar sizes, where they're similar in composition, sort of age or gender, things like that. So I've very much gone through other people's papers and talked about how you go about critiquing, finding, extracting information. For your review, this has very much been what I've talked about today is the methods of how you go about your review. Now you've done it, now you know how to do it. It's time for you to then go and write your review paper. You'll bring in the why of how you've done it. What I've talked about today will be your methods. And then you'll go and do the research, uh, the databases, find results, draw your prism diagram. And then you will bring about your discussion of what you have found out from bringing all the literature together. And maybe you'll write a scoping review. Maybe it'll be a full on Cochrane systematic review. Or maybe it'll be a protocol before you conduct your systematic review. Whatever it is, um, you now have the tools to go off and do it. So thank you very much for listening. And here are some of my details and any questions. I think I'll stop sharing. Let's see. Sorry, that was brilliant, Helen. Thank you so much. Um, I know we have some time for questions as well. So um, I, I, first of all, I really wanted to say thank you to Helen. Uh, it's a, something like a systematic and a scoping review. It's not easy to complete that talk in 30 to 40 minutes. You know, Sometimes it takes half day training at least, but you managed to give the key messages. I'm getting a lot of fabulous message uh, from the attendees. So I have a couple of questions here. So we, so first and foremost from John Gilmore from UCD School of Nursing Midwifery and Health System. Thank you so much, Helen. Great, clear presentation. One of those, how long is a piece of string questions, but timeline, how long would you suggest a systematic or scoping review should take? I have added in a scoping review to a funding protocol recently to conduct over four months with a research assistant, but collaborators suggested that is very um, that was very ambitious. I think we had the discussion all the time. We are in the middle of a two reviews at the moment for a co-vision, but I'm not going to answer that question. I may pass that question to Helen. It is how long is a piece of string type question, but it's also how many data, the more databases you use, the more articles you're gonna get, therefore the more articles you'll have to screen through. So, um, it is a balancing act between how comprehensive you wish to be and how much resource and time and energy you're going to put in. Um, if it is, you so in terms of a systematic review, it will always take longer. Um, not to scare anyone off, but for a Cochrane systematic review, give yourself a couple of years. They are big, they are very comprehensive. Um, two years would be a standard turnaround time. Um, in terms of a, a scoping review, I have seen them done um, within a few months, um, but if you're wanting to be more comprehensive, then you need to give yourself more time. It's also sometimes good, it's a bit cheeky, but put in uh, general search terms to see how many articles are actually out there. And if there's a lot, give yourself longer to do it. If you're finding only a few, then it will be a lot quicker. So sorry that it's not, I can't give an actual length of time, but it really just depends. Um, but I would always give yourself longer rather than shorter. Yeah, um, I just wanted to uh, add something there uh, for John. Um, at the moment, we have a COVIDence. Um, 
which is a web, website platform we can use in terms of organizing the, the, the screening process. That really give us a lot of um, time because before we never had, we have to do manual searching, create our own, our own repository. But now it's, with the COVID and life is much easier and it's, it's quicker. So myself and Helen involved at the moment, at least five reviews in a different ways. So yeah, it is possible, but we need, you need to be organized and um, trying to use the, trying to, trying to understand and use the COVID ends, I would recommend. And that kind of give you, um, give you um, more comfort compared to the manual searching. So I'm going to take the next one from Lisa Lankin. Um, if you're using the scoping, JBI scoping review guidelines, are you better off using their checklist as well as, as well as not the CAFS tool? So. so in terms of their guidelines, they literally are going, you should have a research question, then you should, this is how you should go through database searches. So in many ways, um, the stages that I was talking through today are very much like their guidelines and can be used it, it's your sort of common sense guidelines. Um, there is no um, right to, in terms of there's, the JPI scoping review guidelines are there just to help you along, but you would never actually report that you'll be using them maybe. Um, so it's entirely whichever tool you like or is useful for the checklists um, for the appraisal. Um, I know some colleagues who like, there's certain ones that give you a numeric answer. And um, so they, they very much like that. So they can use, you do a scoring out of 36 and anything from 30 or above is denoted high quality, 25 to 29 is middle and below 25 is low quality. So you get a very clear cut. Um, within the Cochrane systematic reviews, there's uh, guidelines that are different um, quality appraisal that you would use and you very much red, amber and green color code it to whether or not it's a yes, maybe or no answer. So reds or no, yeses are green. And then you just very much look over the study how much red there is or how much green there is to get a sense of it needs, um, or it could be that you are doing um, a systematic review on surgical trial um, and you cannot blind a patient to having surgery or not. So that would be a case where all the studies would be read in terms of blinding, but that's due to the nature of the intervention that you're looking at. So um, there's no one that, that is better than the other. It's just whatever you prefer or maybe your colleagues are used to. So Thanks, Helen. And there is one more, um, just wondering from this from Martina Kennedy, one from Martina. Thanks, Helen. Just wondering, what what do you what do you think about the use of Google Scholar as a search engine? I've seen Google Scholar come in in terms of grey literature. It can be used there. Um, it has also sometimes been brought in as a formal search as well. But you get into um, where do you draw the line if you do a search and you bring back. 100 pages, are you going to look at all 100 pages or do you just go the first 10? Um, so there is an element of, by all means you can bring it in, but um, you also have to sort of give yourself a reason to maybe be bringing it in. If it's maybe an area that you're looking at, that there's only, you're looking for very current knowledge, um, then you maybe would go for Google Scholar, but um, I would still, I would only put Google Scholar in when you have the other databases. I wouldn't use it on its own. Um, it has limitations as well. Um, I think we are ans we answered most of the questions. Um, I know it, it is still, um, the lot of people still is challenging to, when you think about meta-analysis, systematic review, scoping review. My own experience, and I'm, I'm not an expert, but at the same time, I'm in the middle of a couple of reviews. But I think nice to start with a scoping review, you know, try to learn the technique, uh, how to do a review, then you build yourself into systematic review or meta-analysis. But always, you know, when you have this plan, you have a team to work with. And then it's not just about you, you're working with the team, it's a team effort. So then that's what we are learning. And I know Eriton, you are there as well. Um, Eriton is one of our, uh, our colleague. Um, so, 
I know I'm I'm putting you on the spot um, here. Um, the reason I'm I'm thinking about you, Erica, you worked with us as a, as a summer scholar, and you never even heard the term of scoping review. I know you are just learning. Uh, if you could even share a few lines, there are students are listening today because this webinar is also targeting early career researchers. Uh, maybe if you, if you could say one or two words, uh, good or bad is fine, um, you know, rather than just me and myself and Helen is kind of, we've done the review, but it's good to hear from you. Um, yeah, so my background is actually in commerce, so that doesn't even involve like a, like a capstone paper. Um, and now I'm involved in, as a research assistant with this particular project. So um, formal scientific research is new. So scoping reviews as a formal thing is even newer and for me it was really really scary uh really daunting a lot of new words a lot of new terminologies uh a lot of new terminology but um what i would say is that the technology that exists and honestly the, the resources of ucd um like the librarian when you're kind of worried about what databases there are because when you go into ucd library yourself there's like hundreds and you're like oh my god what is this um like there are resources there to help you and starting is kind of, I think for me, the hardest part. Um, but even like Suja was really helpful, at like defining the keywords and stuff like, it. so as was kind of mentioned, it is a team effort. Um, and then once you get into it, it's actually a breeze. Well, right now it is a breeze. Um, <laughs> um, right now I'm in the, the, we're using Covidence to kind of go through title and abstract screening. I'm not sure if it will be a breeze when we get to full tax screening, but um, yeah, right now it's fun. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Ed. And I think that's important for the students, especially they are early PhD students or early career researchers. You know, it's okay. You feel like it's daunting, but as you go along, you will learn. Um, anything, Kari, you want to include? I know you are a very much participant researcher and uh, the scoping is something very new to you. You're muted. Yep. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, um, thank you. Thank you, Helen. That, that really was um, helpful. And uh, it's taken me time to, to get from sort of hearing about the new stuff to then understanding it and now to be able to do it. And I do appreciate the support. And uh, the question about um, Google Scholar got me thinking. Um, I did an entire PhD uh, based on Google Scholar and, and, you know, never even touched the library databases. Uh, but you couldn't do a scoping review or, or a systematic review using Google Scholar because it's not accurate enough. To, to give you what you need. So I will continue to use Google Scholar for all my every day, looking things up and searching for things. But if you're gonna try and do anything systematic, you need to go to the official databases. Thanks, Ari. I think you answered Lisa's uh, question as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, everybody's time. Yeah, Helen. Just yeah. to say, there was a question way at the start, because I'm re reading through the chat um, about our future webinars and will they get emailed about them? So I'd say keep an eye on our provision site, also, which the, the next one Harry is doing in August, um, I believe August. 11th, 11th of August. Yes. 11th, 11th of August. Um, so put that in your diaries. Participatory, and, sorry, Helen, participatory health research with the children. Just really hard. Thank you. Um, but also uh, just to say Suja is mad on the Twitter. So follow her and you will find about everything from her um, is another way to find out when our next webinars will be coming up as well. Thank you everyone for joining us. And it's a, it's a pleasure. I know it's been people coming all over the place uh, joining us today. And you will get an evaluation survey from us and you can suggest any, any topic you think is important for a coalition team to facilitate. And we will look into that as well. So your suggestions are very welcome. And um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Have a good day. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.